as a I think um, for the inquisition itself, I, I believe it is, it, Thomas More was still um, a I mean, um, they didn't reject mm -hmm. Thomas More, so mm -hmm. um, I think it is just like if they explain in the in the preface of the index of forbidden books that um, I think it's here that they, they have forbidden some of uh, Thomas More's quotes not because he's not a happy participant of the of Catholicism but because there are anti-Catholics that might try to manipulate manipulate those words so. <coughs> Satirical remarks on, on Friars in the first Yeah, 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 a couple of the other early vernacular translations also only translated uh, book one and uh, book two as well. I also, so also mm -hmm. those two books, I guess. Yes, actually, the, the 17th century German one uh, by Georg Mittermann is also is only a translation of book two, number right? two, uh, including the, the section from, from the frame narrative where Hislody is actually introduced as a traveller, so including the travel narrative from the from the first book, but then it skips the entire uh -huh. dialogue of Castle and, and goes immediately to to book two as a mm -hmm. fictional society. There were also collections of like travelers' books which would be real uh, geographical accounts and then would also include Utopia, book two. Uh, so you had a great interest in book two, separated from book one. With, with, so you're looking at it in a very different context. Uh, but it's interesting to look at those collections uh, because real accounts are blended with, with these obviously fictive ones. Probably no one published book one by itself. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that. Mm -hmm. I have a question for uh, Liam, and it is whether within that uh, general, um, <coughs> uh, what you have called uh, poetic geography, uh, there is a play, a role to play in the fact that uh, the, these uh, French utopias are uh, plays in Australia, uh, which could be, could be perhaps, the, this is my question, consider the antipode mm -hmm. yeah, of uh, France. So, that uh, there was a critical intention or intention of criticism about that, or uh, do you have anything to say about that? Yes, I think, I mean, that's why they, um, in the 17th century, they're sort of, um, they're building on the travel um, voyage account um, genre, but also choosing Terra Australis as, um, is, is, a, is a kind of, um, it's an uncertain space in the in the second half of the 17th century. In many, on an empirical level, it's kind of a lot of cartographers are kind of deciding that it probably doesn't exist. Um, Tasman's already certainly navigated Australia, and yet it still appears on stuff, still appears on many maps, and on others it doesn't. So it's kind of a paradoxical space. Um, so partly it's because you can set it in um, Terra Australis and it's a kind of a no place. Well, it's a kind of a, you know, it's an uncertain, it's, it's empirical, it's, tr it's truth or fiction is, is, is uncertain. And also because they're also building on the idea, the traits of the antipodes, it's, it's the opposite. Um, all the, um, so it's a way of reflecting on European society. And of course, Vyras has to tread quite carefully, is obviously this quite strong critique of the French regime. In his work, and um, but by sort of you know um, making the, the his main the, the, the Louis the Fourteenth figure a Persian and a Zoroastrian, and then you can sort of start to distance it, and so it can sort of be classed as a as a as an antipodean trope. Mm -hmm. 
um, in, but in Fuanyi it's much more mythical, so we do, we actually get more, and there's more antiquity in type monsters, and there's kind of slight more um, imagination of the south, south that, is, um, that go, um, goes right back to medieval um, tropes of monsters and um, the, 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 the original Greek idea of the antiquities being, you know, the people that, that um, stand with uh, feet to feet, toe to toe with the people on the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if I may throw in a question here what the role of Hall, Joseph Hall's Mundus Alter Idem was within that trajectory because it played quite quite um, an important role in the, in the history of the German translations. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, of course, a satirical text that was presented as a fictional traveler's account to Terra's Australis Cognita. Um, and uh, Wintermann, for example, publishes a translation of Hall just one year after after his translation of Utopia and he calls it Utopia Pars Secunda. So as if Hall's text was um, a sequel of, of Moore's Utopia. So I was wondering if these fictional French accounts are, are to some extent related to Hall. I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, um, perhaps the most obvious one is that um, Hall includes in Terra Australis in his in Paul's Terra Australis, a um, an island of hermaphrodites. Um, it's there's not there's not obviously any other tropes that um, sort of. I mean, it's a very short chapter in in Paul's Mundus, but Funny may have you know got the idea from from that, um, and but he's built a whole philosophy around the hermaphrodite um, aside from that. Um, but I think also Paul is important um, because he introduces. A strong dose of satire into the tradition, so he's it's more classically Antipodean. He's, he's just he's kind of it's the world upside down, mm -hmm. whereas Moore's Utopia is kind of you know much more ambiguous, much more uh, much more difficult. Um, in 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 Hall's Mundus, it's much more um, you know we have direct inversions of European vices and so so and I think and the satirical mode comes out much more strongly, I guess in um, in virus even and and funny even in um, um, even in, in the the scene that I was talking about about the tunnel about the tunnel where um, Savona says well you know I was only joking about taking you to heaven to, to through hell I don't know there's a there's a real satire there's a there's a satire about religion going on there and and um, there's a kind of almost the whole the whole edifice collapses almost I think, at that moment so. Were there further editions of the two 17th century French utopias? Uh, yes, many. Um, um, uh, they were translated into um, 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 German, Dutch, Italian, no, German, Dutch, Italian, English. Um, the Fuani um, had, there was a second. Brazilian Portuguese by Ana Maria Ana Claudia. But more recently? Recent. Or in the Recent. 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 You're talking of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've been read up. And, I mean, the, the, Sever, the Severambians is, um, is the most popular work. As I said, it's even been translated. It was published three times in the Soviet Union. Um, um, it was well read in the, um, uh, in the early modern period as well. Kant and Montesquieu and uh, Rousseau or, or read it, and it's um, um, so it saw many um, many um, translations. Fuani's had a second French edition in 1693, which was probably not written by him because it was the year he died, but written by someone else who who took out a lot of who made it who um, turned it into a deist text, and then that was the first edition that was that it, it was that edition which was translated into English. So Fun News has kind of gone through a sort of a double sort of reception at that time. Now, uh, placing, going back to your earlier point, uh, placing the utopia in the category of travel literature of the 16th and 17th century, one does find a movement from realism into romance and even fantasy. Uh, 
instructions about how to get there, but then what you get, when you find what you get there, it tends to be quite, quite uh, remarkable. Uh, in that regard, one finds utopian fiction uh, geographically placed in a variety of, of places. Going back to searching for the lost tribe, where you have movements of and a society that was divinely ordained, but something happened, and then where, where is it? And it's in Central Asia, or it's in the New World, or it's someplace else. And someplace else sometimes because it starts out in Australia. Uh, that's with that's with the stories of, of lost tribes, but utopianists uh, locate there. Campanella locates his utopia off the coast of South America. Uh, uh, Francis Bacon puts it on the west side of South America, <coughs> and uh, both of these places represent some fantastical place. Is not known? But it is known, and that I think is the important point. It is known, the credibility of a utopia existence is based on the fact that it's, it's located in a place that's known, but not known very well. So strange things are happening. <coughs> this ad aspect of the way in which the geography of utopia takes on this almost, I, won't, I, I don't like the term surrealistic, I don't have it, but it is realistic, but beyond it. It goes beyond the material into the domain of ideas and so forth and all sorts of things. But it is a very interesting concept. And uh, I think that it's interesting that these French authors do seem to be exploiting it. And I think it's this ambiguity um, between its mm -hmm. both. It can be good. There was a kind of a hope that they, there was a kind of, there's a kind of a, a hope or a, that, that uh, Prester John or some Christians will be found in, uh, in in Terra Australis, you know, mm -hmm. but some kind of familiar European civilization might be there. So that's kind of on a, on a practical level. And then, um, or perhaps, you know, yes, it's kind of, sort of like some solution to European problems will be found. Some... Thomas Moore says the utopians have a, have a predisposition to appreciate Greek philosophy mm -hmm. and the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. This may be a, a curious question, but Foyne seems to at one point be talking, if I understood you rightly, about how everyone was of one mind. And while you were talking about that, I was thinking of something that would have been later in Australia, and that's that very horrifying prison in Tasmania, where um, everyone just had a number, the prisoners just had a number, each one was isolated in a cell, and they worked there, they ate there, the only time they got out of their cell was to go to a chapel, and Which they, also had cells in it. They were bought. In the chapel, yeah. They were blinded, as it were, except to see the chaplet. And Somehow that reminded me of Poynne. Is is he? Is I don't. I, I'm trying to make the connection. It's just this uniformity of of <laughs> thinking, uh, and of course in the prison they're trying to correct their thinking. But actually they might be insane, as I understand it. Um, but. It's, it's sort of, it's very uncanny, but to me in a very scary way. Yes, I think both virus and um, there are um, elements of this in both virus and one um, Because I think in the 17th century, this is the time when, um, when I think Paris starts getting, when Versailles is built, you know, there's grand projects with long avenues and there's this this rationalism it, this is a really the age of rationalism i think and um the prison that you're talking about is is like is this is foucault's it's designed on a um on foucault's model of the prison yes. so it's, you've got the, yes. the prison guard right in the middle right. and then the the um the prison is built in 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 aisles around a circle. So the prison guard can always see you. 
you don't know whether the person is right. looking yeah. at you, but you know you might be looked at. Yeah. Anyway. It's, it's... Um, but they're dealing with um, this kind of... And that's, the, that's also how the capital city is built in Virasa's utopia. So it's right in the middle of the utopian islands is for defence. But it's also so in the palace, right. the Viceroy's Every palace city. in the middle of the island, he can see everything. everything. <laughs> in it's, it's, it's uncannily like Orwell's 1984 mm. in some ways. Mm. Yeah, there are these dystopian kind of elements. Yeah. 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 Sure. Mm -hmm. Campanella, it's not that far from that. Mm. Everything goes up to the middle, and up there, you see everywhere. Sort of a line towards the center and the top. Just another question. I'm sorry that to get the second one, but has anyone discussed the, the significance of uh, the fact that the utopians are hermaphrodites, which was the original creation of Adam? Mm -hmm. The original Adam was a hermaphrodite. Mm -hmm. A biblical, I mean, that's, a, that's a, not literally a biblical. Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure there has been some, some discussion of that, but I'm not... Um, um, For the platonic, platonic origin? Well, sure, that's another dimension as well. I mean, the, That's a question for me. So in Australia, uh, if I'm correct, one of the first settlements was, was also uh, colonized by the Dutch, and it was called New Holland, like you have now still New Zealand. The part of uh, what's now Australia was New Holland. Sure. Yeah, and yeah, it wasn't you, just, yeah. Do you have knowledge of um, Dutch colonists bringing uh, the Book of Utopia? Um, well, they, they, the Dutch never colonised Australia. They only visited. Um, they, they, in, in the sixteenth, from in the six, during the seventeenth century, they, they visited and they charted the north coast <coughs> and southern most of the southern coast lines. But they never actually um, stayed there. Um, so, but they did. Um, they were. Um, they recorded their experiences there. They recorded um, meeting with Aboriginal peoples. They re recorded the landscapes that they saw. Um, and actually, you can see in Vi Virus has read some of those accounts. So, so and these um, filter into the um, so some of the descriptions of the um, of the utopian space. Mm -hmm. That um, in fact, the beginning when Captain Sidon arrives in Terra Australis, it's it's. Yeah, you can many of the, land, the discussions of the the uh, the landscape, the brackish the, the brackish water, the sort of the desert landscape, and that is um, reminiscent of um, Western the Western Australian coast the Dutch saw. Um, um, but the yeah the French um, were very suspicious of the of the Dutch. <laughs> records about um, terrorist status and they didn't quite believe them. But the Dutch East India Company kept a close hold on all the accounts and maps that they um, recorded from, from from what we now know as Australia. And um, and under Louis XIV there was a big effort to to get hold of all the as much of the Dutch knowledge as they could. And then the, the French started um, to um, in fact, one of the possible reasons why these French utopias might have been written at this time might be because about a decade earlier, a guy called Homier, um, who was um, a bishop of Lisieux, um, wrote, uh, gathered all this information on, that existed about Terra Australis and about New Holland, and he proposed, proposed a, um, a Catholic mission to Terra Australis to save the Australians from from Satan, and um, <laughs> and he proposed it to Louis the Fourth, both Louis the Fourteenth and the Pope, and they both liked the idea. But um, um, how can I summarise all this? <laughs> the um, but they um, um, but there was obviously in France at this time there was a lot of 
a lot of information about the South that was being uh, circulated, um, and but it was always hard at this time to actually verify what was fact and what was true. Was the were the Dutch documents uh, real or were they kind of you know in the lily? And and in fact, um, Homier even probably invented <coughs> a French explorer to Terra Australis um, who, who arrived there before um, before the Dutch. Um, so he invented his own voyage account. Right? It's uh, cheaper. Yeah, they, were, they were at war yeah. Yeah. from some... Well, they did go sure. to war the French and uh, the French for a while in the 1660s, I think, joined the English against yeah. in fighting the Dutch. Yeah. Um, 72. Yeah. 72, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. yet addressed, addressed the, the, the issue of the role of, of technology or technocracy in the 17th century. Or the question why the Spanish translation came so late. Yeah. I have a question. Did people read Utopia in Latin? Is that all? And maybe they didn't need a translation of mm -hmm. Utopia? Yeah. It's always what I thought. But, uh, yeah. I say there is no explanation for what yeah. many, many yes, like scholars or uh, aristocrats had access to the classical yes. and they didn't need any Spanish translation. I, I think we found, if I'm correct, we found quite a number of uh, Latin utopias in, uh, in libraries, in uh, people's libraries in, in Spain. Could it, could it have to do with, uh, the, the, after all, with the role of the Inquisition and the uh, yeah, mixed sorry. reputation of the Rasmus in, in Spain? Mm -hmm. And perhaps also the, um, the, the not prejudices, but um, the, uh, um, reservations maybe um, against vernacular or certain types of vernacular books that might be dangerous. So, Yes. So maybe the utopia, our readership of the utopia needed to be kept within learned, educated, academic circles rather than that more popular circles. Yes. Would have been my guess. Yeah. Probably, probably have to do with that, but as interesting as that, as the delayed translation of utopia, I think it is that the, the, the person behind that translation was Quebec, who is a uh, of course, one of the most talented writers of the Spanish 17th century, but a Rabelaisian figure, someone who was always on the outside, of whatever side, uh, always against uh, the system, uh, exiled two or three times during his lifetime, and uh, a person who, who probably he he would think he would consider Thomas More a sanctimonious character. Uh, I, I cannot see. What is the attraction? What is the interest of Quevedo in translating or having the utopia translated? Because um, I think that he was one of the most unlikely characters interested in translating uh, utopia. Perhaps because he was so so much beyond caring what people would think of him that he decided to, to make the translation. I don't know. Uh, if, if you've had any yeah. documents, any references, Quevedo, Quevedo had a co writing about Utopia or Thomas More. Yeah. Are we talking about the, the Quevedo that uh, built the Pueblos of Cantales? No, 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 Francisco de Quevedo. Uh, and the poet, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he had a copy of Utopia in Latin mm -hmm. with his handwritten comments on the sides and as Immaculada has said, um, that is probably the copy used by Medinilla mm -hmm. to write his translation. And um, as, as we were saying before, he was using Thomas More as a kind of model uh, to be followed by politicians, uh, Spanish politicians. And he also makes reference in the prologue to the, to the translation by Medinilla. Quevedo himself says, um, it is about time 
that this book is translated into Spanish because there have been some who have uh, wrongly interpreted uh, some of the words that Moore uses. So, I mean, the, the, the fear that the book might be uh, censored are there. And also, as she was saying, there is, a, a, um, there is another translation of Utopia into Spanish, book one and book two. It is in Biblioteca Nacional. And uh, I have recently um, read a paper submitted to Moreana on this translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to be it seems to be as early, the translation seems to be as early as um, shortly after Moore's execution. So that would mean that there was somebody translating, reading the Utopian Latin and translating it into Spanish, but at some point he did not want to publish it. There was some connection that somehow ended up with the De Tristitia Christi in Valencia. Somebody mm -hmm. brought, somebody had a more interest and dropped that book off in the reliquary in Valencia. Right. So there was a conduit somehow between Spain and, and the more exiles in the Low Country. I think after the after his execution, and maybe that's a fruitful way to to explore. Certainly, that. certainly, and that is part of the of the field of research that we will be stepping on in our uh, project, to which I will make reference tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And even broader also, the, the general political context. So we have, with the Spanish Habsburg monarchy at that time, um, a political system in Spain, which is completely opposing the political system that's proposed throughout the Book of Utopia, which is a parliamentary democracy, people elect a parliament, and this parliament in Utopia can elect or depose the, the prince of Utopia. Um, because in, in the low countries, um, the parliament of the low countries around yeah, 1568 uh, wanted to turn away uh, to depose the, the king of Spain, Philip II, uh, and at the start of the Dutch revolt, in the low countries, uh, there's an um, an increase of translations of Utopia into Dutch. Uh, so several first or second or third publications, translations of Utopia into Dutch are appearing at that time. Um, so Philip II didn't agree. He sent his Spanish armies to the Low Countries. Um, and at the end of yeah, around at, at the end of the 16th century, uh, around 1585, uh, the South of the Low Countries, what's now Belgium, remains under Spanish control. And from that moment on, publications, translations of Utopia com uh, fell completely down. Uh, the protest is then picked up further in the north, what's now the Netherlands, uh, the, the Dutch Republic further on. And there, publication translations are going on. Uh, in the 1590s, early 1600s, so I think it's uh, a major reason. So it was perceived as politically subversive. Yes, yes, because they um, they leg legitimized the Dutch revolt on a political system of parliamentary democracy uh, to depose the king of Spain as the ruler of the Burgundian uh, Low Countries. Um, and he, he didn't agree, he had an idea of, of monarchy, political power, that didn't need or didn't want the consent or the, uh, the election by a parliament. Um, so it was completely opposing, completely conflicting. Yeah. I, and from the start on, I think Utopia is a very, very political work already from 1516, from the first publication on. So what we discussed uh, also, uh, um, that's my, uh, the, the view I, 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 I have of the, the book of Utopia. I, I, I turned completely away of uh, the idea that it's Thomas More's ideal society. Um, most parts um, of, of Utopian society you can relate to uh, ideas of 
real ideas of Erasmus and Thomas More, which they were defending for all Europe together. Mm -hmm. But then there's a small part of some absurd ideas, in my view, the economic system, uh, the um, asking permission to the prince for traveling, and wearing the same clothing. These three elements are, in my view, uh, elements that Thomas More and Erasmus uh, didn't agree with. And I see Utopia as, as um, like the, 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 mirror, the mirror reflection of the praise of folly, where you have mostly absurd ideas that at the end of the book of, uh, of the praise of folly, mm -hmm. Erasmus is discussing a small part of folly, the Christian folly, which is completely seriously meant. Mm -hmm. And I see Utopia as the reverse, mostly serious program, the program of Erasmus and Thomas More for uh, Europe, parliamentary democracy, religious tolerance, conciliarism. So many ideas of utopian society are um, you can find in, in the ideas of Thomas More and Erasmus if you go uh, searching every specific aspect of utopian society. But then some elements uh, are um, I, I can't see Erasmus or Thomas More defending uh, a communist system, really not. Um, and that's like being and young with the praise of folly. Uh, also oh to yeah. Oh yeah, and also to defend themselves in this political context because it was such a revolutionary book, such a controversial book in Europe where Renaissance princes were uh, centralizing their power. And with the small court part of absurd ideas, if at any time Thomas More or Erasmus or Peter Gillis or, or one of the writers of the prefaces uh, would be in, in trouble through uh, uh, persecutions or bad for the Inquisition, then they could say, oh no, uh, it's not only a small part of uh, absurd ideas, it's a complete uh, fun story, it's a complete joke. So I think this political context from the start of so, if there are no more questions, thank you very much again to our two speakers and to everybody who participated in this day's very, very stimulating and very fruitful um, dialogue. And, and, um, I would say thank you very much and see you tomorrow at night.